If you're using Angular and Firebase, then congratulations, you have found an excellent pairing. The front end and the back end solution work together very well. However, there are a few ways that you can maximize the utility of Cloud Firestore. And in this video, I wanna tell you about my number one tip. So let's talk about Firebase pricing. The bill that you pay is based on the services that you use and how you use them. If you're using Cloud Firestore, you'll be billed for your individual reads, writes, deletions, and storage. Reads, writes, and deletions cost pennies for every 100,000 operations, but writes cost three times as much as reads. Because of this pricing policy, Firebase offers this resource explaining how it works and offering tips on how you can keep your costs down. For queries specifically, it talks about how you're charged for one read for every document in your query. If you're listening to the results of the query, then you're also charged to read any time one of the documents in the query is revised. As blogs like this one can attest, it's the queries that can get you in trouble, like in the order of tens of thousands of dollars. Along those lines, this tip has to do with managing those kinds of costs. I'm going to show you how I've structured the database in my real life example to manage those costs and make my app perform faster and more smoothly. The app that I'm building is a standards-based gradebook. It serves a lot of functions like entering grades and printing reports, but it also has a way of managing students and classes and standards and all of the information that a school might need. If you wanted to edit the data for a document, say a student profile, you would select that student from the available dropdown and it would open up in a panel on the right. Now the students in the table on the right are all of the students in a particular cohort. To populate this table, one might consider using a query to filter out all of the students in the cohort and listing them and their names. Depending on the size of the school though, this could become expensive really fast. My last school had about 5,000 students in it. For a high school with four cohorts, that means the average cohort size was over a thousand students. So if I was just to perform a query on all of the students who were say freshmen, I would get over a thousand reads in just that one act of populating the table. Obviously, that's not very effective, so another way I could do it is I could just paginate the data, loading like, let's say, 25 students at a time, or putting them in a table that's alphabetically structured. So if I wanted to get a student with the last name of N, I could click on the little N tab and jump over to that selection of students. Pagination is actually one of the strategies that Firebase recommends. Instead, I'm opting for a different strategy entirely. In my database, like you can see here, I have a collection for all of the sets of data I listed earlier classes, students, teachers, etc. However, alongside those collections, I also have a collection called lists. The lists collection has several documents inside. I have documents that list all of the standards, all of the classes, all of the students. To populate the data for the table that I showed you earlier, all of the students in a particular cohort, I keep a list of all of those students inside its own document. This is a very simplified list. It keeps the key or the unique identifier for every single student and only their first and last name, which gives me only enough information to populate the table and nothing else. However, once the table is populated and I select the student that I want to edit, it uses the key to retrieve the student's document and that opens up in the panel to the right. Within the confines of this operation, selecting a student and editing the students, I only perform two reads reading the list of all of the students in the cohort, and reading the individual document for the student that loads. Now this list could have a thousand entries in it, but it's still only text, so it's only going to take a few kilobytes to store and to download. Here's the catch though. Anytime I make changes to the student using the editor on the right, those changes have to be synchronized with the list on the left. That also means if I change the student's cohort, I have to remove the student from the cohort's list and add them to the new cohort that I switched them over to. So for every time I'm editing a student, I basically have to perform two writes on the back end. Now again, I said earlier that every write is going to cost as much as three reads. So if my school had only three students in it, this process would not be worth it. Let's suppose I had four students in the school. Then I have to read four documents. Then when I edit the student, I perform one write, which is the equivalent of three reads. So four reads and accessing the data and the equivalent of three reads to write the data, that's the equivalent of seven reads. Whereas if I have four students and I use this technique, retrieving all of the students, that's one read, writing on the student's profile, that's the equivalent of three more reads, and then 
writing to the list, that's the equivalent of three more reads for also seven reads. So four students is the break even point. Anything more than four students, and I'm going to be saving money by using this technique. Anything less than four students, and the technique isn't saving any time at all, but four students isn't a lot. Anytime you're creating a list, it's better to just keep a parallel list reflecting all of the data, or at least just the data that you need to populate the list, and just perform two writes side by side. If you're using Angular, however, or even if you're using JavaScript and you're just being crafty, but in Angular, you can use a service to download the data that's needed as it's needed and cache it so that as you go over to the other sections of your app, if you need to populate a table or a dropdown, that list is already there and already at your disposal. So saving the list and reading it only once can serve for multiple utilities. Now, I have one advanced note about this tip. It concerns cloud functions. You might already be aware that Firebase offers cloud functions, and one of the cloud functions is the onWrite function, which is a function that gets triggered anytime you write to a document. So it may make sense to write a cloud function that will update the list anytime you change a student's profile. This is totally doable, and the pricing for cloud functions is really good. You get the first two million invocations for free, so unless you're going to be doing a lot of cloud functions, it's really not going to rack up too much in cost. Using cloud functions, however, does not escape the individual charge for each write. It is also possible to write on write functions that trigger other on write functions in a loop. And uh, this can cause problems from your app, obviously. The documentation for cloud functions talks about how to avoid that. It's just something that I would like you to be aware of. So that is the tip that I have for you today, my single best tip for Cloud Firestore. If you enjoyed this, please let me know in the comments. Let me know if you'd like me to make another video. And uh, otherwise, I make videos every week, except when I get ill like I was last weekend and I missed a video post. But uh, I hope you subscribe and that I see you next week. Take care. I can't eat my heart.